Well, let me add my welcome to all of you to the 2016 Red Hat Summit. It's great to see so many people here, by far our largest summit ever. One of the exciting things for me yesterday, this morning, is to see how many people uh, that I know who've been here, been here multiple years, but also how many new people there are. Raise your hand if this has been, you've been to more than one summit. That's fantastic. Well, welcome back. And for all of you who have not raised your hands, uh, welcome to your first Red Hat Summit. I really do hope that you will find this different than so many of the events that you see happen in the industry. This truly is my favorite week of the year. Red Hat is all about participation. That's what we do. Uh, we're passionate about participation and user-driven innovation. But most of that does happen via email, via chat, uh, via phone. And this is the one time a year that we get everybody together and the visceral just kind of seeing people interact, seeing the conversations happen, really brings it to life. And so for me, it is just incredibly energizing uh, to watch that happen live. And so it's my favorite week of the year. Uh, I hope you feel the energy uh, throughout the week. And I want to thank the orchestra that kicked us off today. That was a phenomenal way to start the summit. An orchestra is really a tremendous thing, and Thomas talked about participation. An orchestra and live performance in general is bringing together so much. Itai Talgum, uh, Itai Talgum, excuse me, the uh, famous conductor, uh, once described an uh, orchestra as a series of stories coming together. The stories of the musicians, of the audience, of the architect who built the building, of the conductor, of the people who made the, the instruments, all coming together. In his words, all of these stories being heard at the same time, this is the beauty of a live concert. This is the reason you leave your home. And I hope you feel that here this week. This is about participation. It is about this conference being different because you are here. We hope that you all are active participants in the sessions that you're in, that you meet new people. Right? We want it to be different because you're here. And again, that's the beauty of a live event like that. That's the reason you leave your home. The theme this year is participation and the power of participation. And I want to spend my few minutes that I have with you to kick this off talking about why I believe that this is such an important concept. And that's because participation and innovation are very, very tightly linked. And let me describe that connection and why we're so passionate about it um, over the, the next few minutes. We all know technology is, investing, is uh, increasing and changing uh, incredibly rapidly. There's so many innovations that are happening, yet we're not fully seeing that in how it is impacting the human condition broadly. Uh, Robert Solo coined what's been called the computer paradox. It's now been a while ago now. And the computer paradox is basically says that we see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Now, that's a little dated, and we did see a productivity boost a little bit in the 1990s, but we continue to go back to declining productivity happening broadly. And that actually is a really big deal. I think Paul Krugman, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist, you know, once said that Productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything, right? When we think about being better off than our, uh, our parents were and kind of a continuing, ongoing kind of progression, that is really all based on productivity. And so there really is a paradox around all of this incredible technology that's happening, yet we continue to see declining levels of productivity. And I will argue over the next few minutes that much of that is due to the fact that these technologies are becoming so complex that how we apply those to solve major problems is something that no individual or any individual company can do on their own. That the problem with our declining productivity isn't 
a decline in the innovation that we're seeing in technology. It's our capacity to take those innovations and apply them in ways to solve the problems around us. Earlier this year at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the theme was the fourth industrial revolution. And broadly, the industrial revolutions uh, in this regard go from the early mills in the 1750s uh, that happened in England to the second industrial revolution in the late 1800s with the uh, birth of mass manufacturing to the third industrial revolution, which was the first generation of technologies. And now the fourth industrial revolution, which is a combination of technologies from the communication tools around broadband to artificial intelligence and machine learning to 3D printing or additive manufacturing um, to Internet of Things. And what the conference was about wasn't those technologies specifically, right? We see those things around us, and certainly many of you are involved in these, and much of this conference will be talking about the communities and ecosystems that power components of that. The conference was much more about, well, what are those implications for how we live, how we work, how we lead for communities, for organizations more broadly? And the overall consensus is this set of technologies, as cool and wow as they are, will have a deep fundamental impact on, again, how we live, how we work, how we interact, the nature of organizations themselves. Now that sounds futuristic or grandiose, but let me take you back just for a minute to the second industrial revolution. And again, that's when we first saw the birth of, ma of mass manufacturing in the late 1800s. It was similar to what we're seeing now in the sense that there was a set of technologies that came together that allowed for a significant change in how we work. So those were things like the electric motor and the auto lathe and you know, the electric light. And these technologies came together that allowed for the first time for us to basically mass manufacture goods and services. And if we think about not so much that mass manufacturing, which had a tremendous impact on our economies, this is when we went to starting to double output or productivity, double output per person every 30 years, and that's a trend that we were on until the 1980s. So an incredible change in the human condition associated with that. But if we leave aside the economic impact of that, if we think about the difference in how we lived before versus after, in 1850, the average manufacturing facility had three employees, three. Those were typically family-owned, so it was members of the same family working together to handcraft things. Right? Fifty years later, by the turn of the century, we had these mass, multi-thousand um, uh, manufacturing facilities that were happening in large cities. And that brings us to the next point. Not only were people now no longer working next to their home with family members, I know a lot of people can say, oh my God, what a nightmare. But that's how most people live, right? next to your home, with your family members, small kind of uh, operations uh, doing things, to working in large companies, thousands of people. And that also then caused people to move off of farms and into cities. So even the very nature of where and how we live and the growth of suburbs all happened through this period of time. Also caused profound political change, right? As you got, now had capital and labor that came together and created all this value, how was that going to ultimately be distributed? And, you know, from the kind of more social welfare systems that developed in the U.S. to socialism in parts of Europe to communism and other places, whole new political regimes were developed because of the second industrial revolution. The reason I pause on that is I do think it's easy for us to get in a bound and look at the technologies and not realize how profound the changes will be around us associated with these technical changes. And I think there's a general growing consensus that this fourth industrial revolution will look a lot like the second one in terms of the size and scope of the change in how we live. I actually want to focus on one final aspect of that second industrial revolution. And it was, I would argue, one of the most profound changes that came along with it. And that is how we organize people to get things done. Right? In the second industrial revolution, we now had this issue of having thousands or tens of thousands of people scattered around the world that had to be coordinated to make these 
you know, goods and services in these large facilities. And so we developed these systems of management, so statistical process control, you know, hierarchies, you know, as we know them today, that became how we actually coordinated to get things done. If we look at where we stand today, however, those things, science of management, Taylorism, all of, you know, capital budgeting and all those processes that we put in place to basically organize and orchestrate people doing rote tasks in a static environment are fundamentally changing. With the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, if it can be proscribed, it can be programmed. And therefore, those jobs are going away, right? The activities that are left for people to do are ones that require initiative, require creativity, right? Um, require a, a level of judgment, or otherwise they will be automated, right? And so that's not to say, you know, there will be augmented uh, reality, you know, all kind of things to assist people in doing things, but the jobs remaining will require a degree of judgment. In addition, the world has accelerated at a tremendous pace, right? With the level of connection we have, there is a, just an, an, a tremendous acceleration in the pace of change around the world. And you put all that together, the systems that were designed to help people do, rote, or coordinate people doing rote tasks in a static environment won't get us to where we need to go when the primary way we'll create value going forward is innovation. I see this all the time. I have the pleasure of, of traveling around the world and getting to meet with senior leaders at our customers, um, CEOs at other events. People get that this is a problem. I hear this as a recurring theme, right? People recognize that they are not capable of innovating at the pace they want to innovate. But importantly, they recognize that pedaling harder isn't working, right? The nature of the problem is, diff is different. Right? The hierarchies that have been so good at solving so many of the problems that we had in the first, second, and third industrial revolutions are actually impeding us today because hierarchies squelch innovation. They don't foster it. And I'm a huge optimist, and one of the things I'm most optimistic about is we're through half the problem. People know it. People know it, and people are starting to recognize that their own organizational structures and ways of acting are part of the problem. So that brings up the question, well, why don't they fix it, right? These are leaders of large organizations, many of you in the room, right? And the, you are people that shrink from challenges, right? People are in these senior jobs because they're actually really good at addressing challenges. They rise to challenges. They like it. And I think the real problem here is that it's much harder to break old habits than it is to build new ones. And so many of the very things that make people successful in the first three of the Industrial Revolution, things like being decisive and being directive, uh, were things that were celebrated and they helped make people successful in this world. But driving innovation actually means giving up control. Let me go back to the orchestra analogy. Itai Talgum also once said, the worst damage that I can do to my orchestra is give, the, give them clear instructions. That would prevent the ensemble, the listening to each other that's needed for an orchestra. Right? It starts with recognizing that innovation rarely comes from the boardroom or the executive suite. It comes from much closer to the customer where things are happening, where the action is. And recognizing that, uh, is a critical component to rethinking how we organize to innovate. It actually is even harder than that because we can talk about that in the context of any one organization. But I think we see over and over and over again, individual organizations aren't enough. No matter how big the, the company, there are more smart people outside the company than there are inside the company. And we've seen from observation uh, in nature that the best, most, most robust, most innovative ecosystems require diversity. Diversity of background, diversity of thought, d diversity um, of activity. And that is incredibly difficult to orchestrate within one organization. Right? So 
truly ensuring that we understand and are able to innovate in this new world requires that we continue to build our capacity to participate. The challenge really is building the quality and quantity of collaboration and participation more broadly. Now, most of you, or those of you who raised your hand know that I'm a history buff, and so I have to do a history lesson uh, at the summit. And if you thought you were getting away with just that industrial revolution, I'm sorry, you're going to have to have a bit of a history lesson. This year, though, I'm going to do something a little different than I normally do, because uh, as a history buff, one of the things I love about history is history t tends to repeat itself, and so you get great examples of things that happened in the past that can provide a, at least a frame for how we think about things today. But given that I really want to talk about participation, frankly, it makes it pretty difficult because if you go through the first industrial revolutions, they weren't a lot about participation, right? I think that's part of the problem, right? They were very much about control, organization, coordination, and that led in, this, in the realm of intellectual property, uh, property certainly to locking things up, right? And there's been tons of of books written in, uh, around the sewing machine being locked up and the lack of innovation there, or the aircraft wing and that being locked up. So this year, instead of saying, let's take a frame from the past and apply it, I'm actually going to play a little game of kind of what if. So let me introduce you to Michael Faraday. Now, many of you probably know who Michael Faraday is, and I don't mean the car. Yes, there is a car named after him. Michael Faraday was a scientist uh, in 19th century England who was credited with uh, the underlying research that led to the electric motor, the generator, and more broadly, the principles of electromagnetism. What made Michael Faraday very, very different than most of the science of his uh, scientists of his day is just the way he acted. And you know, his background was different. He was from a working class family he was, and he was self-taught, right? He had no real formal education. And how that manifested itself in the way that he worked is he was an avid experimentalist. He experimented, he did things over and over and over, and he was an active networker. He loved to share his idea. He really, if social media had been around, I'm convinced he would have been that early adopter you know, of Twitter. He was really, really um, kind of deeply passionate about getting more people involved and more people involved. He published things. He worked to bring people in. Now, I wish I could say we knew his motivations, and his motivations were that he understood the power of participation. We honestly have no idea from all the work that's written about him. You know, there's one school of thought that says that he was just really bad at math. And so, because he was self-taught and didn't have the theories around math, he actually couldn't formalize his theories. And that might be true. I will say that that led to a really epic collaboration with James Clerk Maxwell, who was great at math, that actually led to the mathematical formula that, uh, that underlies electromagnetic waves and kind of set the, the uh, foundation for just a tremendous amount of innovation that happened on top of that. Others would just say he was an entertainer, right? He loved to entertain. He would invite people in and show these wow experiments of what you could do with electricity and electromagnetism. Whatever his motivations are, one thing is clear, is that he attracted a huge following of people who became deeply involved in electricity and electromagnetism. And if you look at what happened over the next 30, 40, 50 years, post-Michael Faraday, is we saw a tremendous leap forward in leveraging those technologies, again, to develop things like the electric motor and so many other things. His legacy still lives on today. He was director of the lab at the Royal Institute, and he started something called the Christmas Lectures. And these were lectures that were open to the public. He started off with him walking through his own um, um, kind of experiments and theories and things that he had discovered. Those Christmas Lectures continue on to today and have had speakers like David Attenborough and Carl Sagan. I was actually talking to a Red Hatter unrelated to this a couple months ago and, who mentioned that he had been watching the Christmas lectures again over the holidays this year. So an in incredibly impactful individual that doesn't go down with the Thomas Edisons and others of the world because he gave all of his inventions away. So what if he hadn't done that? 
What if he had taken his discoveries and incorporated or held them tight? We all know that innovations happen on top of other innovations. So what if we were 20 years later, or 30 years later, or 50 years later, in discovering those same things and building an ecosystem that could then do the electric motor and some of the other things, right? You know, I was thinking a little bit about that. It's possible that I'd be up here talking about a PDP-8 and the new you know, punch card reader in bell-bottom jeans. Thank God I'm not doing that. Um, but no, in all seriousness, his inventions led to the electric motor, the radio, television, cell phones, even the screen behind us. So what if he hadn't shared, where might we be? I would argue that building the capability for communities to innovate beyond the sum of their individual members is the leadership challenge of our time. Let me pause on that just for a minute. You know, I'm often asked about crowdsourcing and open source in the same breath. And those are fundamentally different things. Crowdsourcing is about asking thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people for their ideas and picking the best idea. And that's a great thing. I'm actually talking about open source, where it's not about getting individual ideas. It's about the fact that we get people to work together to create ideas that would have never existed before. I am not arguing for enlightenment. I hope all of you kind of get it. There's a power in asking people for the best ideas. I'm arguing that we are still in the early days of defining a system to make sure that we truly get the best ideas built from people working together, the synergy of people working together. In the Industrial Revolution, it was you know, economies of scale. Making thousands of units the same was cheaper than making hundreds of units. And so management was about coordination to make that happen. In the 21st century, our leadership challenge is about how we get people to participate in new ways to create things that wouldn't exist by people doing things on their own. Let me show you a trailer of the video that Thomas mentioned earlier called The Open Patient. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Stephen Keating, and it, this is August 18th, uh, around 6 p.m., and I am making this note as a record to myself uh, and my family and friends and anyone else that's interested, as tomorrow I'm going in for a brain surgery. That's one of the reasons why um, the curiosity, I think, helped me in my condition. And I'm hoping it's helping others now because I've been able to share all that data and post it online. And I've had lots of people contact me. Like I said, two to three patients a week um, say that, thank you for putting this out there. Here's what I'm going through. It's very similar. I'm like, well, I have this data, and this is to help the good of mankind. And it, if I could just, like, quantify myself my way to a cure, I don't, I didn't see that being the right phrase. So I remembered the phrase open source. And I was like, I, I just want to open source my quantified self and share whatever I have to offer. So I write a blog called The Liz Army, and it's just basically about a person who's living with brain cancer. Uh, I, as, as a, I don't know, a super patient, have figured out all the tips and tricks to use my online portal through my healthcare system to be able to download data, or to save it in a certain way, to post it in a certain way. I've learned the language. But if you were to get diagnosed with something uh, today and you would want to access the system the same way I do, we don't all have the same tools. There is no one open electronic medical record system that everyone knows. Should I do proton radiation or x-ray radiation? What type of chemotherapy to do? How long to do chemotherapy? All these are open questions that are up to the patient. So having more data, from my perspective and from many others, enables you to make better decisions. And I thought, well, I have some cool data out there, and I'm, I've 
brain cancer and I've participated in some studies and shared my health information for the good of potentially finding a cure for something one day or a therapy that can help someone somewhere. It might not be me, but it might be 10 years from now, the next person who's diagnosed with what I have. So instead of the data being siloed in these small research groups, I could share that data and I could let anyone use it. But there should not be legal limits on accessing your own genome. How come the doctors and my people across the street from me at my own university can see my future, but I can't? Instead of me having to create my own website and put all that data there, there needs to be a more standard way. And one of the studies recently done was Open Notes. And this was started at three institutions a few years ago where they allowed patients to access the full doctor's notes. After one year, 99% of those patients wanted continued access. I think about 70% said they were treating themselves better. And so Open Notes is a great example of, of that power, and we're starting to see how it can scale. So I said before that building the capability for communities to innovate beyond the sum of their individual members is the leadership challenge of our time. Our ability to solve that will determine human progress in the next century because we are all participants in a whole set of communities. And what I so love about the video, and I have had a chance to see the whole thing, and so I highly recommend uh, that you come watch it, is it brings to stark reality, you know, kind of a key concept that, I, that I'm trying to impart here, right? The open patient's about a what if, right? What if patients didn't feel that they were recipients of healthcare and recognize that they're active participants. But here's the key, if you listen to uh, what was in the trailer, and it's certainly throughout the film, it's not about saying, be an active participant to help your own healthcare. It's that being an active participant not only helps you, but it actually helps healthcare for everyone else. By being part of that system, it doesn't just benefit you, it benefits everyone. Right? And it's not an economic example, right? It's a human health example around that. So what if more patients were enlightened and recognized the power of sharing to help themselves, but more broadly, others in the future who are, uh, have similar conditions? What if doctors valued that participation, actually helped foster and catalyze it? And I know some do, but that's not the norm, right? Healthcare is something that is applied to people. It's not something that people are necessarily engaged in. And what if people doing research and companies doing research recognize the value of open and shared, and if institutions related to healthcare work to actually build cultures of collaboration because they see the value in that? Now, I want to pause here for a second because I'm not talking about a radical change. If there are anybody here from the pharmaceutical industry that's, you know, kind of sitting back and having a heart attack as I'm talking about open, what I'm actually talking about is understanding how we best leverage open to get the best outcomes, right? I was actually talking to a very senior executive at one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world a few months ago, and he basically said, he said, look, I know that we have data in a whole set of clinical trials that we've done that we're no longer using, and that data is probably very, very valuable to other people. And I know that there are trials that have happened in other places where that data could be useful to us, but it's locked up. We don't have a mechanism to think about it. And so we had a great conversation about what we see happening in technology. Because if you look today at Google and Facebook, you can pick almost any web companies, they're obviously competitors for end customers and eyeballs, yet they are two of the largest contributors to open source. Right? They recognize there is a component of innovation where it makes sense to do things together. And we're all better off because of those collaborations and having these massive IT users involved in driving the pace of innovation. That doesn't keep them from being competitors. That doesn't mean everything is open. But it does mean there's a way that we have proven in technology for sharing to work to better everyone, not just Google and Facebook, but all the other people who are allowed to leverage and use the, that same set of innovations. 
I don't know exactly where those lines are or in pharmaceutical or in many other industries, but what I'm saying is that is the challenge. That is the leadership and management challenge that we need to work through if we want to continue to drive the pace of not only of innovation, but more broadly, taking all of that technology innovation and actually improving the lives and the welfare of people around us. And again, it's not just healthcare. We're seeing the need for participation broadly across industries. If you look at you know, what blockchain is doing to require financial services companies to work together to, off, uh, to be able to offer and build uh, value on top of things like blockchain, or autonomous driving is a great example. Right? No technology company can do that themselves. No transportation company can do that themselves. No government can do that. It's going to take all of those working together to ultimately build a system that allows autonomous driving to take off. Obviously, Internet of Things is going to require companies in the same industry and cross inter, uh, industry to work together, not just on standards, that's obvious, but more broadly on how you kind of take the power of that and have that to work together. I said earlier on that I'm an optimist, and I am. And let me take one example from Fourth Industrial Revolution, and that's artificial intelligence, right, or machine learning. AI or machine learning is a fundamental pillar to so much of what we are going to see happen over the next 20 years. And if you took an old world industrial logic associated with that, it's like, you know, patenting the light bulb or, you know, it's a technology you would think, wow, I want to lock this up because I'm going to be able to profit from this for the next, you know, 20 years. But let's look at what we're actually seeing happen in AI. Google open source TensorFlow. You know, Amazon's open source, it's AI engine. Microsoft is open source, it's AI engine. Facebook is open source, it's. Now, and then uh, you see Elon Musk and what he's doing with open AI. We're seeing this kind of broadly, broadly happen. And again, these companies aren't charities. These are for-profit companies that have shareholders and they are working to create value. The point is that they recognize there's more value in being open and building ecosystems than there is in locking it up and staying closed, right? There is value in ecosystem and participation, and we are seeing that more and more and more. The great news is I think leaders broadly see that. It's not a matter of if, it really is a matter of how. How do we do this broadly cross industry, inside company, um, in, inside departments, right? It's a whole set of levels of how we do this and how we do this differently. It's not too different than having to create the original hierarchical structures and Taylorism and science and management that happened in, you know, 100 years ago. We need a new paradigm. And Red Hat's all in. This is something we've been working on for 20 years, and I hope we can play a small contribution around this. Our mission statement is to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners building better technology the open source way. This is a mission statement we developed eight years ago. And I want to pause on it just for a second, just to shed some light on at least how we think about this problem. When we were first developing the mission statement, we did it in a participative way, as we always do at Red Hat. And the first draft of the mission statement started off to say, to be the, uh, the leader in communities of customers, contributors, and partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a number of our people who are deeply involved in a whole set of open source communities came back and said, that's not accurate. We're not leaders. Leaders implies a level of fiat or control that we don't have. And so we went back and you know, I'll call it our beta draft. We came back and said, okay, Red Hat's mission is to be an active participant in communities of customers, contributors, and partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those same people came back and said, well, that's not accurate. We actually are working to drive the direction and participation doesn't really sound like we're driving direction. And of course, I'm in a traditional, you know, kind of second industrial revolution world. You say, well, are we a participant or are we a leader? And finally, one of our engineers came back and said, well, we're a catalyst. Right? Because we are there, things happen. It's not because we can demand that they happen. It's not that we have control over them, but because we're there, things happen. I want you to feel that way at Red Hat Summit. Because you are here, this event is different. Because you're here, 
you're helping influence the myriad communities that are involved here, right? Red Hat's involved, and therefore the Summit's involved in hundreds of communities from Linux to OpenStack to Kubernetes, KVM, you know, a whole series of communities that are here. And hopefully you all have a, a, either an opportunity to participate in that upstream level or how those technologies are ultimately used, right? That's the goal of why we get together here. That's why we want you here and involved in participating. We have a Gandhi quote that we have on the walls of, of virtually every Red Hat office. And it basically says, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. It's a famous quote, you've probably heard that. At last year's summit, Paul Cormier, for the first time, basically declared that at the Linux level, we've won. Right? We, meaning the open source community, has won. Right? Linux underlies all of that innovation that's happening around AI is built on top of Linux. IoT is, uh, uh, is built on top of Linux. Uh, mobile devices, you know, virtually all of the fundamental kind of innovations that are happening uh, around the fourth industrial revolution are there because of Linux. And if you think about that in the context of technology, that's an incredibly powerful thing. We've been able to demonstrate that a broad participative community of a very diverse group of people working together can create such an important, impactful technology. And that's a great thing. But if you frame it at a broader level and we think about the broader problems of how do we apply technology to solve world problems from hunger to you know, uh, environmental issues, uh, global warming, et cetera, we're only just getting started. All of those problems are going to require participation to solve. No one brilliant person, no one incredible organization is going to be able to solve those problems. So I hope while you're here, you get deeply involved in the communities that are represented here. But then when you go back into your own communities, either ones represented here or other things that you do, I hope you think, about the power of participation and how you can apply that more broadly to solve problems in your own organization or more broadly in your industry or the other ecosystems that you're involved in. Following me, you'll hear from Elwin Loomis from Target. He's gonna talk about how he's applying this set of principles uh, at Target. It's a great set of, of kind of examples of how you can kind of think about this in a kind of more practical context. Uh, he's a great speaker. I think you'll have a great time listening to that. So I, I hope, again, you can take some of those learnings from what I've talked about, what Ellen will talk about, and what you'll hear uh, over the course of the next few days, and really think about how you can apply those. Because I really am convinced that we can accomplish so much more together than the sum of what our organizations can do individually. So with that, let me again welcome you to the 2016 Red Hat Summit. I hope you enjoy it. We're thrilled you're here. I hope you participate, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible. Thank you very much.